God, for the victory that's in this house tonight. Thank you, Father God, that you've rolled some things away and out of our lives, Lord Jesus. I believe the move of the Lord tonight is he's going to roll some stones away. Come on, man. You know how you get out of hell and how you get out of death? You do. And what it does, it rolls the stone away. Come on, we sing that song before that, man. Ask the stone what happens when God says it's time to move. It has no choice but to move. So I believe God's here tonight to set us free of some things. Come on, how many know you don't have to die and go to a fiery pit to be in hell? Or is this me? I think I got the right crowd. (laughs) Victory's on the other side of it, though. So tonight, Father God, in the name of Jesus, I just roll a stone back and away. By the power and authority and the delegated influence that you've given us in and by the power and the name of Jesus Christ. See, you can can sit back and you can sit in a hell hell of a place. I can't look at Michelle. She thinks I take it out. You can set me in a hell of a place, so to speak, and what it does, and that stone rolls across there, Michelle, and what that happens, what happens then, man, is it just blocks you into a place, not knowing sometimes, Mom, that we have the power and authority in our voice to move that stone out of the way. We'll sit in that same place, some of us, day after day, year after year, some of us for decades, and sadly, some of us, Frida, for a lifetime, thinking, man, that God did it's over with. Come on, the powers that be, they thought, man, when Jesus got put in that tomb and that stone got rolled over that tomb right there, it's done. Amen. Man, they were rejoicing, declaring, Rachel, man, we got them now. And they, they, so they knew it wasn't just Jesus, if I can say it that way. They knew that Jesus represented all humanity. If we can take care of Jesus and keep him down and kill him, the rest would be a joke. And they thought that they had us. God showed up knew what he was doing. The victory was already there before Jesus ever hit the tomb. Can I say on your behalf, victory is already on the inside of you operating before you ever hit a tomb, before you ever, let me help you, man, before you ever make a bad decision, before you ever get in a bad spot, before you marry the wrong person, before you take the wrong job, before you take that first hit, that first drink. Come on, man. Come on, it's real now, Michonne, right? Glad you're back with us again tonight. We stand in a different place. We're not in a tomb anymore. So I'm just prophetically saying tonight, stone be gone. I'm going to pull you up out of there, not because of anything in me, just because of the Christ Jesus on the inside of you. It's one thing for me to get you jacked up, Michelle, and get you fired up and get you running out the door, and it'll last about a day and a half. Come on, I I know who I am. (laughs) Because if I do it on my own behalf, that's what will happen right there. And I can take scripture, I can jack you up, but it ain't worth nothing. Except that it's like a quick fix. It's a quickie. Come on, it's head knowledge. It, it, it's good for just a moment, man. But as you get a hold of the Christ on the inside of you, man, the stone can't be rolled back in to place to hold you back anymore. But what we have to do, Free, we have to make a decision. First of all, like Michelle said, we praise our way out, man. We'll tell that stone, get out of my dad blame way. And that's as politely as I can say it online. Come on, y'all don't, get, y'all don't get real with God and stuff like that, man. I've talked to two or three people, and it's just Wednesday, man. I've talked to two or three people said, I had a real good talk with God this week. <laughs> Come on. Is it you? I won't look at you, God. He's looking at me. We got no business in a grave. Got no business in hell. It ain't, it ain't where we're designed to be, Rachel. So I rolled the stone away in the name of Jesus. And I was proclaiming this before I ever came on the hill or heard any kind of songs. I don't know what's going to be played. And I think about that stone right there. And when it comes to my mind, man, was another stone. See, there's one stone that's set in place by the enemy, Rachel, to keep you trapped in a certain place and to never let you out. Because they can keep you. You know how it's being in a tomb? Come on, it wasn't a tomb tomb like what we think where you're getting put in a pretty little vault in a casket or something, get placed down in the ground. I'm talking about the tomb in this, that sense being a cave. You ever been in a cave? Not a spiritual cave. Walk with me here and we'll build this thing up. I guess this is where we'll go tonight. A cave, if you get inside and you get out of where the sunlight's coming in, it's dark and it's cold and it's wet and it's damp and it's nasty and it's muddy and there's places that you can get hurt. And if you slide down in certain places, you will not come out of that thing. No matter how much you scream and yell, how much you throw a fit, how much you plead and do this and that, man. And then spiritually what that means is the very same thing. We slide down into a place, Rachel, if we're not real careful, 
it will try to determine and tell you that you're in a place with a bunch of bats. It'll make you scared to move. It'll make you scared to do anything. And then sometimes in life, center people will just give up. And a stone, man, standing in a way that we have power to move to get the sunlight in. Now, that's one stone. Can I tell you about another stone? The rock of our foundation, the solid rock that is Jesus Christ that's placed in your life to give you freedom and to give you liberty. He overcame the stone to become a stone, if that makes any sense at all. But you know what we do sometimes with that stone is we reject it. The very help that is sent on our behalf is the one that we reject. This is Psalms chapter 118, verse 22, and it says, The stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. Now, by New, New Testament um, ways of looking at it, we know that he became that chief cornerstone. He became the headstone in our life. But that word refuse right there means to spurn something, Frida. You ever spurned anything? You know what that means? It's like if, if I say something real good to Michelle and she don't like it, she will spurn that. <laughs> Come on, I, you reject it. You reject what's being said. What you do in another way to look at it in Hebrew, it means to cast, you cast it away. Jesus shows up on our behalf and he presents himself to us in a mighty way and he begins to dictate to us who we, because of his death, burial, and resurrection, because the stone's been rolled away and you come up out of that tomb with him. Whether you realize it or not, you spiritually set in high places, made to sit at the right hand of the Father with power and authority and jurisdiction and all those wonderful things tonight, man. But if you don't understand that, you will sit in a place of defeat and the stone will stand in your way. It's really like I was telling you Sunday you about the fleas and all them things jumping and the gorilla walking back and forth. You've got freedom in your life and you'll just stay in the same little path back and forth. Thinking that there's no way out. When the stone, can I give it to you in another translation? I'll look that up too. That word refused. And it was used in Acts chapter, I believe it's Acts chapter number 7. And it was used into what it means there, man, is just to contradict. Do you understand that the freedom that we have comes by us not contradicting who God already says we are? It's that simple. Come on, man. Y'all tied on me tonight. It's all right. We'll get loosened up here in a minute. So, Psalms 118, verse number 22, in the Passion Translation, says, The very stone the Masons rejected as flawed has turned out to be the most important capstone of the ark holding up the very house of God. Now, we can preach that with Jesus or we can bring it back to where we're at in our lives at this very moment and just begin to declare that some of us struggle because we've just rejected Jesus. Now, I'm not talking about whether you're born again or not. That, that's a whole other six months of teaching right there. Rejecting or, or, or not coming into agreement with what God says you are will cause destruction in your life. The very thing that was sent on your behalf not just, when we, we talk about salvation, it's bigger than you getting an eternity out of a fiery pit, man. Come on, man. The Greek, let's break that down a little bit. You know this, man, but it is your healing. It's your deliverance. It's your being made whole and being whole. It is the power of God to help you to preserve you for such a time as this. But if we push it off into eternity, it will have no effect on it right now. And the very thing that was sent to help us, we will reject. Now, there ain't nobody in this room, Michelle, that probably say, oh, I reject Jesus. That's right. No, you wouldn't. You'd stand up and give him glory and sing 30, 45 minutes of song, giving him glory and honor and praise, which he does rightfully deserve. Hear what a messenger has to say. Reject what God says to you, not because it's me. Just whatever messenger shows up, take what God says, reject that right there, walk out here just as defeated or more defeated than you did when you walked in here because you said, I don't want your direction. I ain't, get me out of it, y'all. Look, It ain't me. Christ in you, the hope of glory. The very thing that is sent to help you, to save your life, to get you out of your pit, you reject. Come on, I mean, I sit and say you. I'll just use me as an example. I'll reject it. The way that I reject it is not coming into agreement with who God already says that I am. Jesus is who he is. Jesus has done, done what he's going to do. It's a finished work. We just sang about that as well. The, the, the work Jesus has come to do is already finished, complete. How about what he's doing in us? Am I making any sense? 
Come on, I gave you a scripture out of 2 Timothy chapter number 2. I think it's around verse 11, 12 right in there where it says, If I deny him, he'll deny me. I broke that down for you. That word deny there doesn't mean that you're saying no, 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 and what we've been taught. And that if I don't receive Jesus, man, that he's going to deny me. I've done taught this. So I'm going to break it down because I've got I, to flow from there. It just very simply means that you can't. The word deny means contradict. It means that you're contradicting what God has already said about you. But you know the great part of that, and I've done taught this, but I'm going to say it again. That when it says that if I deny him, he'll deny me, what that means, Michelle, is I can just deny who I am in Christ because if you go up in the scriptures before, it'll tell you that his death was your death. His burial was your burial. His resurrection is already your resurrection. It's not something out in your future, and if you deny something now, he's going to deny you, and you're headed to a pit. Very simply means that if, I, if, I, if, I, if he says, Chris, you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, I say, no, I've denied him. I've denied the Christ on the inside. We think it just means that you didn't receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That's not what it says in context. Come on, anybody with me. I'm messing you up. I need to get you a rolly chair to spin around. Do you want me to stand up here? Okay. The good part of that is it said, if I deny him, he'll deny me. And what that deny right there means is that very simply, he will come back and tell you how wrong you are. They ain't got nothing to do with the fiery pit. He will come back and say, because you, this, and the very next word, scripture says, even if you don't believe, I'll be faithful to what I said I would do. See, God remembers his covenant even if you forgot it. Can I, come on. Even if you don't believe it. Whew, that's good news for us right there, man. Even if I choose not to believe, he said, I'll be faithful because I cannot deny myself. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now remember, we're talking in context of something that's already happened up there, and he's done showed you that his death was your death. Right. And as he come up out of that tomb and rolled that stole away, stone away, and he come up out of there, you did too. Yeah. So the only way that we can reject God now is just to very simply not come into agreement with who he says we are. Yeah. Now I said that like it's, that's good news, and it is good news, but your life here on the face of the planet will be greatly affected about whether you come into agreement with God or not. I can feel some of you, right? It's not, put the eternity, the eternity set. You ain't got nothing to worry about eternity. Just, just, just let your mind go that. Eternity set, now what are you going to do? Well, I'm just going to scrape through life. Glory be to God. And if I can just make it, man, and I, come on, man. Surely we were meant for more than that. Surely God's abundant joy and life, the Zoe life on the inside of us can produce more than that right there. Now, they ain't got nothing. I'm not down on people that, that, that are in a, in a certain spot. I, I get in spots myself, but I'm beginning to learn how this, it just becomes like a moment or a little blip. It don't control my week. It don't control my month. It's not going to control. It's certainly not going to control my life. I had one of the craziest days today that I've had in a long time in a lot of different areas. And it always, Mom, seems to happen on Wednesday afternoon right around 2.30. I mean, seriously, I went through the... Now, I had a little, we had a little hard start this morning, but we got through that at work, I'm talking about. Made it through that. Day's going good. I'm outside thanking God for the peace, and I should have just stopped right there, I guess. Thank you, God, for the peace that passes all understanding that you've given me today, man. It started out hard, but it has turned out wonderful. Got in my box truck, and the phone started ringing. And it was things that happened, man... Jenny, I have to take care of right then. It's not, it's not one of them things I can put off till tomorrow afternoon or take care of it tomorrow. It's like, and I'm, I'm, you know, and I'm bad to look at my watch. I think, man, it's 3.30. I ain't, I'm running out of study time here, Lord. And throw it back on the Lord like it, his, it was his fault that all this stuff happened. And I said, no, Lord, man, you know I need to be studying and doing some things. I need to pray and I want to do this. And I need to hear your voice. Didn't phase him a bit. He didn't magically take care of all my problems. I got on the telephone, did some things about 45 minutes later. Now it's time to study. And I thought, well, we're out of study time now. And if I'm not real careful, I want to blame that on God, but it ain't God's fault. But what I've learned in that, man, is it don't matter. I'm going to get to this. I've got some scripture on here with this. It don't matter if, if I go down there and study. I'm going to set myself up right here. It really, Bill, doesn't matter if I go down there and study or not. I can still come up on this hill, and if I'll open myself up to God, it'll flow anyway. Because it's really not dependent on me. Now, yeah, see, y'all's like it. Now, if you're the one up here preaching, 
I ask that when everybody says that. I think, man, I, I've been praying, man. It's just not coming in. Oh, God, God's going to give it to you. Three minutes to six. And it's like, sure, it's easy for you to say, well, if you're the preacher. Well, I'm not a preacher, though, so good luck with that. God's faithful. It's his anointing that breaks the yokes. It's not Chris's. But we're trained to think if we don't do this and we don't do that and we do this, 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 that, man, that God's just going to, he's going to, oh, he's going to drop you because he, Bill, he can't handle it. He's just been doing good for what, how many ever millions of years or since the beginning of whatever that means. He's 100%, by the way. He ain't failed yet. That's a pretty good record, isn't it? But sometimes I'll roll in here, Michelle, and think he's going to let me down tonight. Tonight's the night. He ain't never going to let me down. He's never going to let you down. The only thing that things and how things get flawed in our lives is if we very simply reject the one that came to make it right. Amen? I'm going to give you some scriptures and get Michelle where she can turn back around and not spin in her chair. Y'all still good? Let me just kick off from, from where we were right there. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. Let's start in verse 14. Second Timothy chapter number 2. It says, of these things, now I'll just give you 12, 11, 12, and 13 about us denying him, him denying us, and how he cannot deny himself. Amen? Now, in context, let me, let me back up a little bit. Right here, we've got to remember who he's talking to in context. This is Paul. His life is getting ready to end, and he's trying to encourage Timothy, who's going to sort, who is his student or disciple or his mentor, I mean his prodigy, so to speak. He's trying to encourage him. Now, if I was in, in prison, my head's getting ready to get chopped off, or I'm getting ready to die, I'm probably not going to write to a pastor buddy of mine about how to keep going. This me. It, it's, it's, a, it's a very large testament to Paul and the cross that was on the inside of him, though, to be able to do what he did right here in the timing of what it was. But I want you to remember who he's writing to. He's writing to somebody that's getting ready to go out and make other disciples and have other students. He's going to be a pastor to a group of people, and he's trying to set him up so that he has success. Amen? Verse 14 says, And of, of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Verse 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now this series, I guess if that seems like God's went a couple different ways the last couple of services, but this all started with me in verse number 15 right there. About studying to show thyself approved a workman that not needeth be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. From that we've been trying to understand what a false prophet is or a false teacher is and what does God say one is. Not what you watch on your videos, not what YouTube says, not what your favorite channel says, not what your other, other favorite preacher says, but what does the word of God say. And when we start breaking this down, because what we're seeing and what we're beginning to see is there's too many messages out there. There's only one real message. Jesus Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection, it really either took care of it all or we're in bad shape. And if you preach it, and you see, it's like when you take law and grace, man, and you try to preach them together. And what they do is they bump heads. And old covenant and new covenant, they start bumping heads. Can I say it to some of you that may have been divorced or been had an extra boyfriend or girlfriend or two? It's like when you take what happened in your last relationship and you try to bring it into a new one. That's a good picture right there, ain't it? It doesn't work because what happened before has nothing to do with what's going on right now. Amen. How good it would be just to let all the past go and step into your future and not bring that garbage with you, right? That's exactly what Jesus came to do, to let go of some past, let go of an old covenant, let low of rules and regulations and just show up with faith, Amen. to show up with mercy and with grace, to show you a new way. And that's exactly what Paul is trying to show Timothy right here. And when he's calling back to remembrance and things, I'm going to slow down and teach. I'm, I'm about to get fired up. Of these things, put them in remembrance. Of these things, put them in remembrance. What things? The things that I just showed you. Remember, verses up here, he's saying, when you go to teach people, the only thing that you really need to talk about is the cross. There's nothing else to preach. There's nothing else to talk about. Now, does that mean that all we talk about is just a, a structure or a symbol of something? No, man, it breaks down. You're, you're never going to out-preach the cross. Anything that you're digging in there to find better point to Jesus and to a cross, or you better back up and think about it again. Come on, I know that's strong. It's a new covenant. It's what it's all about. Everybody say, let it go. He said, of these things... 
put in remembrance. Who's he putting in remembrance? Yeah, I thought about that a little bit, man. I'll say it tonight, but when I think about something being put in remembrance, it means that I had the truth of it at one time, and God's just calling it back to remembrance. Come on. Now, contextually, he's talking about the cross and the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but when I started thinking about that, even when I think about the Lord's Supper, and we take communion, y'all take communion, right? Come on. It's not a, is that a trick question. It's not a trick question. Can somebody cut the heat down in this place, brother, please, in the name of Jesus? Thank you, somebody, whoever. It's hot up there. Maybe it's just them lights. Y'all cold? Huh? Okay. Well, just right. <laughs> when, when you call something back to remember, even Jesus, when he's sitting at the Passover, right before he's getting ready to go through the hell that he went through and his death, burial, and resurrection to get back up again, man, he's talking about the Passover, but he's got a bread and a wine. And he said, in the future, when you do this, do this, you know, drink my blood, eat my flesh. I'll let that go. Do all those things, but when you do it, do it in remembrance of me. Now, at that particular time, he hadn't been to the cross yet, and they thought he was crazy and thought he was talking about being a cannibal and drinking his blood, and they weren't going to have any involvement in that, and neither would have I. I would have thought Jesus has finally lost his mind. Come on, man. I start talking about Jesus like that, and y'all get that look in the eye. What would you say if somebody showed up? What if I just showed up? At your house, and we're eating dinner. And I said, here, take this as my blood, Rachel. Sure, Chris, I'll take that. What? No, you're not. Come on, there's some, there's some symbolic and some spiritual significance to these things. They couldn't see it at the time, and sometimes we can't see it either. So God calls back to remembrance. Now, if, if something has been there before, then God calls back to remembrance. It means that it was there when I came to the face of the planet. Can you agree with that? How can God call something back to remembrance that I never had? That's not very fair. That's setting me up for failure. Yeah. Or if I ask Michelle, Michelle, hey, what'd you do with those keys? Try to call it back to remembrance, but I never gave her the keys to start with. That's pretty bad, isn't it? She's not going to travel or go nowhere. None of us are. Amen? So God's calling back some things back to remembrance. Contextually, I need to get back to this. Contextually, what he's talking about is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So if Paul is getting ready and is telling Timothy that, then what is the significance to that to that to us? It very simply means that there's nothing else to call back to remembrance. How about if we're open to what God and who he says that we already are? God's not doing anything new. He's not going to pop up on the scene and, and say, Hey, I've got 66 more books and a brand new canon for you. There you go. Check that out so we can go further. Could it be that the Bible holds everything that we need? And that you came to the planet with the knowledge of it. You know some scripture for that? Ephesians 1 and 4. That you came here with Christ before he ever formed anything. You got it all right now on the inside of you. So what holds us back? I think it's how we see God and how we perceive God sometimes. And I'm not going to stand here and tell you that I don't mix stuff together either. I don't, I don't intentionally try to mix messages. I need to, yeah, I can go ahead with this. What happens there, though, is that I probably do. You ever heard the preacher talk out of both sides of his mouth, kind of like? Here's how I kind of see it. Is if we're going to take scripture, this is a side nugget, I guess, but if we're going to take scripture, Miss Joan, and we're going to read it by the letter of the law, and it's going to mean exactly what, what it says and what we think it says in English and all that stuff right there, then the whole thing's got to be done that way. See, that I gave you this Sunday, but what that happens is, is what we'll do, Michelle, sometimes we'll take scriptures that we want. and we'll, My grandfather told my mom that one time. He said, now, Carol, you can't just take scriptures out there and make them mean what you want and take the ones you want. Is that the truth? Yeah. So we'll take that now like me. If I got short hair right now, I can say, yeah, you men can't have long hair. Give you, give you the scripture for it right there, but then I'll take another scripture like the one I gave you Sunday and, and then treat Michelle like crap and say, well, that hair thing, now that meant that's a natural thing. But man, that, that other thing, it's a natural thing, but it's a spiritual thing, and you're going to be coming against God if you don't submit yourself to me. So which way is it? What do we do with the truth? What do we do with the word of truth? Do we rightly divide it? And what does that mean to our lives? 
Does it cause detriment or does it bring life? It should be bringing life. Of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words. That word, that word um, strive right there, it's, it goes with James chapter 3, verse number 16. It says, where there is envy and strife, there is confusion in every evil work, man. We're not to strive for anything. Can you agree with that? What happens is I think where we strive with those things. Now, he's talking there again to somebody that's getting ready to be a teacher or is a teacher and getting ready to be a pastor, man. And he's charging before them that they stray of not, to, not about words to no profit. And what we do is we get into vain babblings. We get into conversations with people, man, trying to defend God. Or I do. I don't know about you. You ever done that? Or just get to the point, man, and, and, and we just don't understand things, so we just leave it alone and we don't. We say, I just don't understand that. I'm never going to be understanding. Have you ever heard anybody say, man, that, that we're not supposed to understand God completely? Have you ever said it? I've said it a time or two, but I said it out of the justification that I don't have to study anymore. I don't need to pray. I don't need to do that. There's just some things. God's this big mystery. But if it's Christ in you, the hope of glory, the mystery is unveiled, by the way, in the New Testament. And that is what it says. The mystery is unveiled. Christ in you, the hope of glory. But then we deny the Christ that's on the inside of us. Not by not accepting him as Lord and Savior, but very simply not understanding, man, that we are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ Jesus. And if we never see ourselves at that level right there, we'll always be down at a lower level. We'll always say that we're unworthy. We'll always say that I'm less than. You ever feel unworthy? Maybe every day? No? You don't do something during the day and think, man, I shouldn't have done that right there. What I used to think was I needed to get down on my knees and just continually just do this and do that, and i got to do this, and then God's going to do that, and, man, I'm just going to go, oh, my God. But when I found out the truth about things and understood that God's moving on the inside of me, man, then I don't have to be less than because I'm not less than. What if we just started coming to an agreement with God? Do you understand that when things get called back to you, do you know why... How does it work for me? How it works for me is if somebody's up here teaching, I'm not the teacher, I'm the preacher, and somebody's up here saying something, man, and they say something, it may be something that I've never heard, but it's like it clicks, Michelle, just like that. And I know it's the truth, and I may not know exactly how to tie that together scripturally and hope the person up here will do that, but something clicks on the inside of me, and it goes contrary, derogatory to everything that I've heard up to that point. What do, we, what do y'all do with that when it happens? To me, what that means is God's calling back to remembrance something that's already true about me, man, and it just hit me. You ever have them God moments like that? Where God shakes your world up? What if we begin to establish, like I was saying Sunday, what if we just begin to establish new doctrines? <clears throat> Anybody, come on. I'm not talking about something flaky. I can see that looking at you. I'm not talking about something flaky where I take one scripture and I warp it up real good and I'm saying this is what thus saith the Lord. I'm talking about doing what we're doing. Now, I believe the reason that God's showing you this, this, this very simple... Di- I'll take some more words here in a minute if you'll let me. This very simple scripture, that one that I used about you deny him, he'll deny you, and how it's being taught up to this point with no, no revelation beyond that right there, holds people captive. It holds people in the tomb that I just talked about. It holds them in great. It really holds them in hell. On the face of the planet, if I can say it that way. It doesn't set you free. There's nothing liberating about it. Can I say this? If you're reading Scripture, man, it's not setting you free. Well, you may be reading it wrong. Is that okay? Is it supposed to set you free? Come on. You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free, won't it? Does it? What's the truth right there? I'm getting ahead of myself, but I'm going to preach it anyway. The word true there in the Greek means true like what you think it does, but it means true as not concealing. The only thing that will hold you back in life is not setting the truth free on the inside of you. Now, I've done, we've had too many services where we've shown that you come with all this stuff to the face of the planet. It's already, I'm convinced, it's already there. There's nothing that you've got to do except just wake up and believe, man, that which is, God says is true about you. Jesus is the way, the 
It's the same word right there. It's used in John 14 and 6, and I think that's John 8 and 32 about the truth and how it sets you free. But what he's telling him to do right here in verse 15, he, or that verse right there, he says, come to, we need to rightly divide the word of truth. But see, that's where the confusion comes. Because you can't take one scripture and form a doctrine out of it. You can get a start there, but it's got to tie in line upon line, precept upon precept. And what we've done is we've taken these little, little one-liners. Can I give you an example of this right here? I'll show you what a one-liner is. Y'all still good? Yeah, we're good. I know it's a little different tonight. You're okay. That, that chapter in Psalms um, 118 is where we get some other scriptures. Now, in that same group of scriptures right there is a scripture that we quote when we're praying over people a lot of time. It says, I will not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. You ever heard that one? It's a one-liner. Verse 29 says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endureth forever. And there's several more there, man, that talks about the, we can rejoice in the Lord and the things where we get these one-liners, man. And I get it. We take those, and I've done it before. And you put it on your little post-it thing, and it's got the little glue strip, and you put it up on your mirror. So every morning, like we were saying Sunday, you can clear that mirror off and see a clear picture of who you are in Christ. But you can't do just one-liners. Come on. It's a great start. That's it. It's a great start at the morning. Most of those devotionals, you'll find it out of... Psalms chapter 118. His mercy endured forever. That means I blew it last night, but there's hope in the morning. It may have been crazy last night, but joy comes in the morning. And we'll hold on to that. That's enough to get you up. But it's a one-liner that won't carry you. Come on. Could it be that we struggle with things and we wonder why all them one-liners that did it like I just preached a minute ago. I, I can jack you up for a minute and, to, you know, Friday morning you'll be all crazy again. Because it's a one-liner thing. I'm not interested in one-liners anymore. I want to get to the heart, and that's not like I can dig tonight and get to the heart of God, but I can start expounding on something that gets us closer to the heart of God and what he's really saying in Scripture so that we can take one Scripture that talks about denying and change a life. What if it's never preached the other way ever again? Come on, what if, you're, what if Josiah never has to grow up and hear it the other way? He thinks, well, really, the only way that I can deny him is just not believe what he already says about me, and because of that, he'll never deny me or have to come and correct me at all. How about that? Or we could preach it that if you deny him, he's going to send you to a big fiery pit for the next six billion years. Huh? <laughs> fear starts creeping in then, and they'll, they'll do it out of fear. But then we've got, see, there's a contradiction right there. We're not being given the spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. Now, which one is it? What's the truth there? Let's, let's take that one for a minute. Is that okay? Which one is it? What did God give you? What, what, what didn't God give you? But then there's all them scriptures. You've got to fear the Lord. It's the fear of the Lord. There we go. The whole point of this and the, the, verse, the point of verse 14 here is that there's a mixture coming and Paul knows that. Let me just get to the heart of this so I can continue on and you can get to Cracker Barrel. There's a mixture that's coming on the scene. But if Timothy doesn't know the difference between it, he's never going to be a great teacher and he's never going to go forward because he's going to be jacked up too. Can I put it back on us? How about us? If we don't ever understand that there can't be a mixture taught y'all okay yeah. charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words and no profit but to the subverting of the hearers subverting right there is the Greek word catastrophe it's where we get our word catastrophe it means, to de it means demolition figuratively. It means apostasy. It means to overthrow or to subvert the here. What is he saying right here? He's saying, man, when you begin to mix this together, what you're going to have is a catastrophe. Yep. And it's apostasy. And I begin to think about apostasy. And I think about some of the teachings that are even out there right now where when the end times comes, when the end of the world comes, there's going to be this great apostasy taking place. This means a falling away. I guess I'll stay right there. 
And they say when all these things happen, then, man, that's when, when, it's gonna, that's when the end of the world's coming right there, right? And if you looked in the natural at the church right now, what do you see? Catastrophe. It looks like there's a falling away. Come on, look around. <laughs> Every pastor that I talk to, man, they're only about 30% filling their churches back up since the pandemic. And I thought, well, the, I could see where you could start to preach it that way. But I, then I begin to think about another way, that God's not in this down message. The world's never going to end. So what, what could we say there with that? Could the falling away means that we're just falling away from two messages and we're getting back to one? To where there's no more mixed message in this thing. Nothing but truth. But it comes back to rightly dividing the word of truth. Subverting, man. And these conversations, or rather the debates, they create confusion for the listener out there. Now you got to think about who the listener is there, the people that are listening, man. And to me, it goes beyond me just standing in a pulpit right here. And this is, this is a call, and I understand those things, but I think of there again. My mind now goes back to, goes to, to Lily June. And who's listening and what's at stake right here? And are we going to let another generation pass away, or am I going to pass away? And leave it for Kristen to do, and then she'll have to pass away and leave it for Lily Jean to do, and so on and so forth. And the next thing you know, it'll be a new two, another 2,000 years go by, and the church will be standing in the same place. I don't think that's going to happen because I do believe there's a great awakening that's taking place right now, and people are coming to understanding the truth because even what Pastor Michelle just said a second ago, man, that's not what that word means. But everybody don't know that that's not what that word means, fear. They don't know that. Everybody say it's up to me. Verse 15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, what I've thought for most of my life is when it said to study to show, th to show thyself approved unto God, I thought that means, especially as a pastor or a teacher, but Sean, what that's going to mean is I'm going to have to study all the time. Come on. If I'm not behind in reading in the Bible, I got to read a book. And if I'm not doing it, I need to be praying. If not praying, I need to be fasting. If not fasting, I need to be meditating, man. And what will happen, Michelle, is I'll push everything else to the side, thinking that I've got to do this. And what we've been taught, see, we're going to tear down something else. What we've been taught, Rachel, is that if I'm not studying, then God's not going to approve of me. Have you ever felt like that? That's not what the word study right there means. Study right there means to use speed, to make effort, and to be prompt. So, what if, what if the writer's actually saying it like this? Why don't you use the speed of what you're learning and make it? Oh, I mean, let me back up. I'll do a little pastoring here. You have to make an effort. Now, I'm not talking about, I'm, I'm not, and I'm not against studying. Lord God, I, I try to study all the time or as much as I can. I try to find balance between being a good husband and a good pastor and a good this and that. And this and that. It's just a big juggling act, seem like. But what if the writer here is saying something a little bit different? And it's not that if I don't study, and I said that a while ago to bring you to this point about, you know, I could just not study today, and I'll show up, and God will do something, right? What if I begin to see it a different way? What if what the writer's seen here and what he's calling back to remember is, why don't you hurry up, you speed, make an effort, and be prompt to understand that what I've said contextually in the last six verses is already true about you. Meaning what? Why don't you just go hurry up and go ahead and accept what God already says is true about you because what he's saying is I'm already, you're already approved. Even that right there is different, ain't it? God forbid I don't have to do anything to be approved of God. If you had to do something, you'd blow it. If, if you weren't going to blow it, why did Jesus have to come? Did he die in vain? That right there, what I just told you, ought to set you free. That you're already approved of God. You don't have to study to do it. Do you see how different words broke down and how we're establishing new things, man, that will change lives? I'm going to go back to Josiah. He'll never have to think that he has to do anything to get approval from God. He's going to know that God's approval of him is already stamped on him when he got to the face of the planet. He doesn't have to do one thing. How about when kids, Mitch, don't have to come and get counseling for something because they already know who they are, Michelle, to the point that they're already set free. 
Do you know that every time that I counsel somebody, man, what really happens is I point them back to Jesus Christ and point them back to the cross that's already on the inside of them. But if I could show them that beforehand and raise them up, Michelle, to the point that they already knew that from when they got, when they hit the face of the planet and grew on up, then I'll never have to counsel them because they'll already know. They'll make wise decisions based on the Christ Jesus on the inside of them, not what culture or what somebody else has told them, maybe from a pulpit that scared them to death. Now, I'm not saying that we've got it all. We're just now starting to dig into this thing. But we're digging and getting to a place that's deeper in God, which means we're getting to a place that's deeper in the cross that's on the inside of us so that we can get to higher places. I'm just where I'm at right now, but where I'm at is not where I'm going to be tomorrow. I don't mean that I'm in a bad place right now and I'm down and out and this and that. Man, I'm in a great place. If my phone wouldn't ring at 2.30 on Wednesdays, I'm in a, I'm in a good place. But I'm not, I'm not going to stay here. I believe there's greater places. And just to be transparent with you, Joan, I need to quit preaching mixed messages as well. I don't, like I said, I don't do it intentionally, but there's some things that come back in there. Is it a natural thing or is it a spiritual thing? What I'm beginning to understand, if I can understand the spiritual part, it will flow into my life and the natural part will take care of itself. Come on. You, I'm not telling you to go out and get wild and do all that stuff, man. I'm just saying that because what we get into then, it's, it's a behavioral control system. And that what we have to do, Michelle, is we have to do it on our own, on our own strength and our own willpower and all those things. That never worked out for me. I don't know about you. But if I can put it all back on him and see who I am, man, it will take care of itself. My life didn't get changed because I changed my behavior. I tried that for the first 30 years, and that worked out miserably. My life changed when I got a hold of the truth of who I was in Christ, and I allowed that to flow in and through me and let it flow out. You know what it is to be a good teacher? I, th I thought about it. I, I was thinking about, really, I was thinking about Nikki and David being here. And that things begin to, to, be a, to be a good teacher and to be a good, um, good illustrator and let the Christ on the inside of you flow out. They were, they were standing here after service. I think David was gone, but Nikki was standing here and Avery was here Sunday morning. She was standing with Avery. And I begin to think about, you know, being a good teacher is not necessarily getting up and proclaiming anything because we're all teachers in one shape, form, or fashion. I heard a podcast with, with Donna Barber the other day, and she was talking about something that D.L. Moody had said, and he had said, I'm paraphrasing a little bit here, he would said something to the effect that um, 99 out of 100 people will not go home and read the Bible every day. I was thinking about studying those type of things. He said, but about 99 of them will, will every day look at a Christian to see what that means. What are you saying? People, people aren't going to get in the Word. Most people aren't like you all, man. They're not going to get in the Word and get anything past the one-liners because that's the, that's the feel-good, drive-through, kapow thing. But what they'll do, Rachel, is they'll look at our lives. And that's not to put it down. They look at your life, and nobody's, nobody's hitting 100% of the shit that I know of. But they'll look at your lives, and they'll say, man, you know, it'll go one way or the other. Now, I'm not necessarily in complete agreement with that either because it's really not up to you to live your life so that somebody else can look at your life and say, well, there's blah, 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 blah. But if we allow God to work on the inside of us from the inside out, our lives will, will automatically portray who God is. We will become the express image of God on the face of the planet. Back to Nikki, I just, it hit me a little while ago. Nikki was standing here the other day after service and she was talking and Avery was here, like I said, which is her granddaughter. Now, Avery came down from Children's Church, and she had a little thing, that little, their little treat thing that they have. It's like Cheetos and something else. And she came bopping down through there, you know, and could see Nikki, and her eyes got big. And she, she, Nikki was standing here, and she went over, and she stood right next to Nikki. I began to think about the, the teacher part of that and the love and how, how, see, let me say this. Paul's teaching Timothy to be a good pastor, but we're really all pastors in one sense. We all have a role to play. So what, what, is, what is Avery seeing in Nikki's life? And does Nikki have to, does Nikki and David always have to just scripture her? Just scripture, 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 give her a bunch of one-liners. Are they good? Yeah, I'll probably lift her up. And she'll probably memorize some scriptures. Is that great? That is fantastic, man. But she needs to see something greater than a one-liner. Let me say this as I continue. You need to be something more than a one-liner. 
Nikki's standing here. And she's talking. And what Avery did is she come up. And they, I don't know. What, what does she call Nikki? Mamma? Mimi. Mimi and Papa. Or is that it? So they see them in. She sees something in them. Now, Avery don't really probably understand really exactly what she's seeing in. I'm going to use Nikki. What she's seeing in Mimi right now, all she knows is love. I'm standing next to love right here. But for her to grow into who God's called her to be, she's going to have to see some action other than that. Now, now she's standing next to Mamma right here, and she's got Mamma's leg. And if you know Avery, man, she's, she's tied on Mamma right here. Um, what did I say? Oh, okay. Mimi, we watched that movie the other night. Mimi, she's standing, I'll just use Nikki, how about that? She's standing next to Nikki right there. And she's got her hold of her leg right there. And, and she's, she's, she is social, but she's very kind of to herself too. Now, she trusts, she trusts Nikki right here. Because she knows that if Nikki, if something comes between, something's coming to get her, that, that Mimi's going to jump right in front of her. She can jump behind Nikki, man, and Nikki's going to take care of business. Ain't nothing going to get to her right there. But I begin to think about how how would she how does she perceive things like when Jenny come up to talk to her, she's standing there next to Mimi and Jenny comes up and she kind of she tightens up on Mimi right there because somebody that she don't know real well has come up to address her, so Jenny says something to the effect, "Hey, how's it going? We're so glad you're here. Did you have fun in children's church or something to that effect?" And you know she's talking and because because Nikki has received um, Jenny. Now she, she loosens up a little bit. Now she, she relaxes. There's no threat. There's nothing. Mimi said it's okay, so it's okay. So I begin to think about that in a church aspect, but what about the outreach that we've been talking about doing? What about when, when, when Avery begins to see Nikki reaching out to other people? What does that do? What does that do to her? So could it be that being a teacher is more than just teaching a one-liner? You teach, let me say it this way, all you have to do is be. But if everything that you're being is in contradiction to who God says that you are, you're not going to go very far. And at some point, Avery's going to buy, is going to see through that. See, the world sees through stuff, man. I think they have better discernment sometimes than the body of Christ. Because we're trained and formed to do a certain thing no matter what. Well, there's somebody that's in need. I have to go show up because I'm a Christian. I'm, I'm required to do that right there. That's a load of garbage. Well, you know the scripture, man, about Jesus said, if you've done it one of the least of these, then you've done it unto me. He didn't tell you to go out and to change the world and do it for everybody, though. Come on. We have to have wisdom and discernment to know what to do, but what if Avery begins to see that at a young age? Not just Mimi loving on her and protecting her from bad things and no one using Mimi's discernment to know whether the threat's coming or whether this is a good person or not using Mimi to know who to give $20 to or hold it back on. We have to raise her up to know who she is in Christ so that she has the wisdom and discernment to rightly divide the word of truth and know what that means. You're not dependent on anybody other than Jesus Christ. And if you are dependent on somebody else, you better watch out. Because I have found that everybody on the face of the planet is going to let you down at one time or another. Amen. Except who? God will not let you down. Y'all still good? It's feeling better in here, I can tell you that. Not, I'm just saying the heat thing. Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not be ashamed. Workman right there is a tooler figure, but it means a teacher. I kind of give you the example of what that means right there. It's not, we don't have to be ashamed of who we are in Christ. And for a long time, we, I've seen, or I'll use myself, I pull back sometimes. Be in a conversation or talking to somebody and you know a greater truth than what's being said. You want to reveal that, but you don't want to come off conceited like, hey, I know everything. But also, you can't be ashamed of who you are either. In the sense of that, because, you know, even when we teach in here, a lot of times, even, even though I use this one a lot, but you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, and a lot of times you can see it on people's face, I'm not the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You are accepted in the beloved. I'll give you three scriptures. No, I'm not accepted. No, no, no. You know, you're worthy because of the Christ. No, I'm, not, I'm unworthy, man. I'm a dirty, rotten scoundrel, and I'm, I'm a sinner, and I'm a this, I'm a that, I'm a this. And if we never accept that and we're always ashamed of who we are, I mean, we will toil 
like Adam, man, trying to till a garden that wasn't ours to till. All that we're supposed to do is just water what has already been planted. But if what has been planted is thorns and thistles, man, we're going to have a hard time. What if we just unveil the garden for what it really is, man? It's just a place in the presence of God. That God walks with you every single day in the cool of the day, man. We have access to that. Amen? Not be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. I'll, I'll quit here and give you a little bit of hope, I guess. That word rightly right there doesn't mean really what I thought it meant. That word rightly dividing the word of truth right there means rightly dividing, but it means to make a straight cut, to dissect, and to figuratively it means to expound upon or correctly um, to expound and correctly divide the divine message. But it comes from two words. It's a compound word there. Right means is rising. Perpendicularly, it means to erect horizontally. It means level or direct, straight or upright. Second part of that means as if by a single stroke, more keen or sharper than. First of all, the word rightly right there very simply means perpendicular. It means something that is erect and is standing upright. Horizontally, it means something that is level. So to, to rightly do something points to the cross within itself by definition in the Greek. It also means that it's keen, and it means that it takes one cut. Come on, Hebrews 4 and 12. Did I give you that? I think I did. Maybe. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and of spirit. It will rightly divide things. But the word of God does not come in according to this and have to just keep chopping at something. As I think about David, man, and Goliath, and, you know, he threw the stone, so to speak. He throws some Jesus at something, hits it between the eyes and changes his way of thinking, knocks it to the ground. Then he goes over and he takes a sword, and he says that he cuts off the head of the giant. Could it be that a lot of times we'll sit in a place there again of what we're talking about tonight where you sit in a place of power and authority. You've got the keys to get out of hell. You've got the authority and the power to roll the stone away, man. And we got that right there, but then we face the giant. And you know how you kill something, really kill it? Is you cut its head off. You cut the head off something, it is not coming I mean, without the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not coming back to life. You cut my head off tonight, I'm not living anymore. Unless miraculously God does that right there. You kill it by cutting the head off. And I don't think, I think for too long what we've done, Jenny, is what we've, we've went through life and we've taught people that you've got to just continually cut at something. Whack it. Give it a, let me say it this way. Give it a one-liner. Is this too bad? Is this too much? Because I'm taking Scripture, making it sound like Scripture ain't working, but I'm saying there's something deeper in Scripture. There's a deeper root to things that's going to save your life. You can one-liner it all to death, and what that very simply means, I have to get up every day and say, the joy of the Lord is mine. I've whacked it, whatever I'm facing, whatever that giant is in the back of my mind, whether it's depression, oppression, low self-esteem, lack of energy, whatever. You fill in the blank right there, and you get up, and you whack it, and you keep whacking it all the day long. And you whack it on this side, and you whack it on that side, and the Lord is this, and the Lord is that. I'm not telling you not to throw scriptures at stuff, because they do work, and it will carry you. But what if you can get rid of what's causing you to have to whack at something? Does that make any sense? Get rid of the giant. You get rid of the giant by keenly using the Word of God, and the Word of God, and it's quick, and it's powerful, man. And according to the other scripture, it's a one-time hit. Now, I'm not down on anybody, man. It's not that I don't have to process through certain things, man, but I'm beginning to see that it shouldn't take as long as what it does in my life sometimes. What does that mean, preacher? Can I bring it back and bring it practical to you? Why? Go to church. There it went. Sucked the life. Whatever life we had, it just left the building. Go to church. Well, I don't have to go to church to know God. No, you don't have to know to go to church to know God, but you'll sure get encouraged here, or at least here, I hope. You'll get encouraged here. You get edified. You get comforted when you need it, man. You're going to get a deeper root of something so you know that God's not crazy. Rightly divide the word. Rightly divide the truth. Remember what truth was? Truth is the truth. It means true as not concealing. Could it be? I'll quit right here, I guess. First quit. First closing, whatever they call it. That the truth, that, that the way that you're going to get the giants killed in your life is to quit concealing the cross that's on the inside of you. And by that, I mean, I'm taking this a step further. I'm not talking about just, I'm not, I'm not taking away from accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and calling out on his name. I'm not. Did you hear what I said? But I think there, if I can say this boldly enough, there's something beyond that. 
the way, Michelle, that we don't conceal God, that we don't conceal the truth. Remember, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. But if you conceal that truth, you're never going to get set free. What do you mean, preacher? Let me break it down. There's my second closing. That if we conceal who we are, I'm not talking about Jesus. I'm not taking Jesus out of the factor here, but I'm also, I'm more concerned about the Christ in you. If you can, let me say it this way. I don't know how to say it really. For you. If you conceal the Christ that's on the inside of you, you're not ever going to get free. By that I mean if God says that you are something, that's who you are. Quit, quit going, especially to church, and leaving there feeling less than. Is Jesus less than? What did he come out of that tomb with other than resurrection life? Nothing. He either came out with it all resurrection life or he's a liar. Y'all don't like it either when I call him a liar. I'm not saying, you understand what I'm saying? I need to preach this better. The whole gist of this and what Paul is telling Timothy, man, is don't mix the messages. Christ in you is enough. It's already transpired on your behalf. Just receive that. I can't help it. I've got to give you two more scriptures. That's probably the most powerful thing that you'll hear tonight. Those quit concealing the truth that's on the inside of you. If God says you're delivered, accept it. I had to accept that in my life, Bill, at one time. Because I thought, delivered, boy, that sounds good. I'd like to have some of that right there. But see, what I thought it was, I was just going to be a cleaned up version of who I used to be. That, that's not the truth. That, that's a one-liner. The truth is, is that because of the salvation of Jesus Christ being applied to my life, I am delivered. That means that if you're delivered from, you're not carrying Josiah around anymore. He's been delivered. He's, you can't, you understand? He, he, I'm not doing this justice tonight. Don't conceal the truth on the inside of you. First, you've got to understand what it is and rightly divide it and figure out what that means. I need to say this and figure out who you're going to listen to or who you're not going to listen to. <laughs> Leave that alone, I guess. It's quick and it's powerful, the truth that's on the inside of you to set you free. Do you know that when I got delivered, I got delivered that very day that I realized who I was. I didn't know anything about what that even meant. But that very day, I was delivered from some things I needed to be delivered from. Now, I had to figure out what that meant right there, but it was that, that simple. I never had to go back to being who I used to be because the, in 45 minutes, somebody took and rightly divided the word of truth, pierced the, the thing that was bothering me, and cut its head off right there. I never had to go back to that if I didn't choose to. The only reason I would ever go back is because I would think less of who I am than who God already says I was and forget maybe for a moment, that I actually was delivered. And when that did transpire, somebody called it back to my remembrance. And I'm not talking about necessarily I had this prophetic dream at night. A messenger got up and people around me that loved me and brought back to remembrance who I was. And what they said, Michelle, was this is not who you are. Get up out of the dirt and get going again. They didn't give me enough time to lay and waller into Adam. They said, get up. Time to go. And guess what happened? I got up and allowed the Word of God to do what it had already done, but they called back to remembrance something that was already true. Y'all still good? Yeah, got 12 of you. All right. I want to leave you with these two thoughts right here. Let me see where they're at verse-wise. Verse 24 says, and the servant of the Lord must not strive. There again, where envying and strife is, is, every, is all confusion, every evil work. But be gentle unto how many men? All men, apt to teach and patient. That's, that's part of that teaching part that I've done expounded on a little bit. Verse 25 says, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Is that up there? Understand that right there. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Do you think everybody's who they are in Christ? Let me, let me back up. Do you think everybody comes to the face of the planet with who they are in Christ on the inside of them? Do they have the ability on the inside of them to be everything God's called them to be? So in meekness, we instruct those who oppose themselves. Didn't say anything about the devil. Didn't say anything about your crazy husband or wife. 
How do we oppose? We oppose ourselves by denying who we are in Christ Jesus and the truth that that brings. You ever felt like you oppose yourself? Man, what if we quit just doing that? What if we could really figure out who we are in Christ and what that means? Starting with the very simplest thing of what really salvation really is and what it means to be delivered and what it means to be healed, and we quit opposing that. Come on, if you're denying, if you're denying him, you're just denying the Christ on the inside of you. You're contradicting that which is already true about you. Release yourself from that stuff right there, man. Quit opposing yourself. Every time I've made up, not every time, but 98% of the time when I've made a poor decision in my life, it's because I've opposed myself. It wasn't something somebody was doing to me. Come on, take ownership of some of your stuff tonight. It's going to be all right. I oppose myself. Anytime in my life right now that I'm not doing and going forward at the pace that God wants me to, it's because I oppose myself. It's not because God hasn't shown up and already rolled the stone away, if I can say it that way. Is that all right? If God preadventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, to change your mind and acknowledge the truth of Christ that's on the inside of you. Stand your feet. I'm going to quit. Please. Okay. Father, I thank you tonight. I thank you, Jesus, for who you are. I thank you, Father God, that we've heard and will make a decision tonight, Father God, not to not to deny the truth of Christ that's on the inside of us. We acknowledge that truth. We know that by knowing that truth that we will be made free, Father God. Tonight, in the name of Jesus, we won't conceal that in which we truly are right now, which is the righteousness of who we are in Christ. We are the healed. We are the delivered. We are the set free tonight, Father God. We expound tonight, Father God, on the truth and the depths and what that means in our lives, Lord Jesus. I thank you, Father God, for this moment. I thank you for the truth as it is revealed, Lord Jesus, not concealed but revealed. Thank you for this great and mighty people tonight, Lord God. I thank you, Father, that you've given us a lot to think on tonight. We take that, Father God. We meditate on that. We ask you, Holy Ghost, to rise up to help us, Father God, to receive this tonight. In the name of Jesus, Father God. I thank you for that tonight. Thank you, Jesus. We want to pray for some people before we go. Thank you, Jesus. First of all, I want to just say thank, be thankful to God for the, some of the healing that's transpiring. Man, Mom's doing a whole lot better. I talked to David Rodner. He's healed and strengthened. He's back at work. He's, the COVID is defeated. Sherry's doing better. Pastor Cheryl's doing better. Um, those that were not doing well are doing better. So God is a healer. He is a strengthener tonight in the name of Jesus. Who you want to pray for? Thank you. Father. Okay. I'm standing for him. I'm just going to pray. If y'all if you lay hands on Michelle or just stretch your hands toward her, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Father, for the healer that you are, for the strengthener that you are this night, Father, in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Father, for rising up within Jim tonight. I thank you for the report coming back, Lord Jesus, that will allow healing to arise on his behalf, Father. We thank you for a good report tonight for Tim Eubanks. He's received a good report this day, Father God, and his body is continually being strengthened and healed, Father, in the name of Jesus. And we lift David up to you, Father, for strength in his body, Father God, and we just speak over his sinuses, Lord God, and declare an opening up, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Father God, for taking infection out of there, releasing him from that, Father, and bringing the breath of life in and through him, Lord Jesus, tonight. We thank you for all these families, Lord Jesus. We thank you for the healing that's transpired. We thank you for those that weren't doing well but are doing better now, Father God. And we just declare wholeness and completeness and health over all, Father God, in and through the power in the name of Jesus Christ. We declare it, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
Who? Thank you, Father. Okay, she's standing right behind you. We'll lay hands on Amanda then. Thank you, Father. Father, we, we lift up this family to you, Lord God. We thank you, Father God, as hard we pass from this life into the next. Lord God, that you've received him unto yourself, and he stands in a great place today. He stands in you, Lord God. But with his family, Father, we just lift them up to you for strength, Lord God, and for comfort and peace that passes all understanding, Lord God, that tonight that they receive that from you, and they're able to draw on the comfort of knowing that you're a loving God and a merciful God and a forgiving God, Lord God. We thank you for the peace that will continue over this family, especially over the next few days and decision-making those times, Father God. And we just call back to remembrance some great memories that they have of their life with this man before he crossed, Lord Jesus. And Father God, and what he's left behind, Father God, that they'll, even in tragic situations and in sadness, Father God, we know that something good will come from all of this, that that's the way that you do things, Lord God. And so we just declare that goodness to come from this, Father God, and the goodness being that comfort and strength and peace, Father God, and just knowing that you there again are a loving God. So we honor you in that, Father God, tonight. We send light and life to this family in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Father, we just release ourselves unto your goodness, and we thank you for that, declaring you Lord of all in the name of Jesus. Can you say amen? Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap tonight. You are dismissed. Yes, I'm sorry. Go ahead.